When you started years ago, you played piano. Yeah, I, as a child, um, we had a piano in the house, but there was no like great pianist in the house. But we had a, a baby grand piano that my mom studied on when she was a kid. Wow. Um, I was blessed to turn on the TV with my parents, and the Liberace show was on. Wow. And the Liberace show completely captivated me. I mean, he was his style and panache, and yes. the candelabra and George would come out. And yes, play. But, yes. And I started studying piano when I was uh, just turned five years old, and I just took to it. I, I, I just lived and breathed it. And by the time I was seven, I had won awards from the Hollywood Bowl as like the most accomplished young pianist in Los Angeles uh, for I that imagine. age group and all that. But by the time I was 12, I was completely burned out with it. Um, I had done, I, we had, I had a piano teacher who I think greased my folks so much about things. I think she was living out her, her lack of career through me. <laughs> so I was learning all kinds of pieces and having to do recitals, and I think it took its toll. So I entered junior high school at 12 years old, and I kind of went, Ta-da, I'm here, your <laughs> piano player's here. And the music teacher, his name was Ted Lynn, said, there's 50 kids play piano here, we need a string bass player. <laughs> and I kind of went, what's that about? You know, I didn't even know. And he pulled out an old K uh, blonde upright out of the back room, wow. put it in my hands, and I hit, held it and hit one note, felt that vibration, and I said, sold. How powerful. And uh, he gave me rudimentary lessons uh, on the bass. And, uh, and I became one of the string bass players in the orchestra, and then we did a dance band, so like, like three months after I started learning bass, we were playing Autumn Leaves and oh, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So it, it was great. It was a real I, it, transitory period in so piano I, I, stuff. How much did piano assist you in, in understanding the concept um, of playing bass, or did it? I think it did a tremendous amount yeah, for me. Yeah. Well, first off, I, my parents were incredibly eclectic in, in their record collection. So, I mean, I'd be listening to Beethoven one minute and Martin Denny the next. And, oh, uh, cool. you know, it was, this, it was a very, uh, it was a wonderful household to grow up in and, and, uh, and sitting in front of the old Magnavox hi-fi and, uh, and listening to the, <sighs> then the Righteous Brothers and, and, and uh, James Brown records and all sure, that stuff. Sure, sure. So, the, but as my, when my career actually happened, I was very fortunate because the piano really, first off, it, it got, had my reading chops completely up where a lot of guys, when opportunities came along, didn't have the skills. Absolutely, yeah. So having the reading skills was great. Also having it come from piano, there's times where I've done sessions and the copy is screwed up and the, and the bass part shows up in treble clef. So I can, I can still, I mean, I have to think for a minute yeah. about it again, or if it's in tenor clef or something, I can, right. I can get through it right. at all, or if it looks too common, I might make a few notes, but basically if I wrap my head around it. So the piano was, it really set me attuned to music and, and, the, and the demands, and so when studio work started happening, uh, a great deal of it was just with people like James Taylor, there was no music or anything, we would just hunker down and, and rehearse and learn songs in the studio. But then I started doing a lot of films and, and television and commercials and more legit dates where so guys came in with scores yeah. and all that. And I went, yeah, yeah, no problem. So, what, so was there music in your family? I know your mom played a little piano, but was there anybody, in, was there, other than having just playing music, was there? The, um, the only person in my family that I later found out about, um, my mother had a cousin and his name was Herschel Burke Gilbert. And he was the head of uh, Four Star Television Music Department, and he, he wrote the music for The Rifleman How and, and a bunch that? of shows there, because I see his name come up like, when How I'm watching some that? of the old TV shows. Um, and I, I, we had gone to their house many times for you know, family functions and didn't really know, but when I was about 15 years old, um, he let me in a little band I was in come to his house and he had a little studio at the house and we recorded some demos and we were terrible. Yeah, I mean, it yeah, wasn't yeah. any good. He was very patient and said, get <laughs> these kids out of here and drive me crazy. Um, but uh, that's really, I, I think there were some different people within the family that, that, that ha had accomplished certain things in music. But most of the family, my father's, I, I was from Milwaukee and my father's side of the family was all Milwaukee. My mother's side was Duluth. And so once we moved to California, when I was like four years old, there wasn't a heavy communication with them, so I wasn't aware, but I've heard a few rumors uh, 
the ones who didn't go to prison, I guess, had some music opportunities or something. Like that. You know, they formed a band in jail. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> Did you learn bass by taking lessons? Did you learn bass by having listening to bass players? Well, you, originally, I mean, when I, he first gave, brought the bass out, yeah. um, he sat down and explained about the neck and where positions were and all right. that. Then eventually I got a Samandel book and started going through that. Okay. Then there was a, um, a, a teacher that I started with named Thurman Teague, and he was in Reseda. And uh, he got me much more classically involved in it and really started to understand. And then when I left him, I ended up with a, a fabulous teacher named Nat Gangursky. And that had like a lot of like really heavy hitters. I was one of the youngest students he, he had had. And, um, the problem I had, everything was upright at that point. Right. Then when I really started, because I, I, there's chronologies in this stuff. I was went into college in 65, and I was in college from 65 to 70. In 69, um, I was in a band called Wolfgang. And um, our drummer was an English drummer. His name was Bugs Pemberton, and he was part of Jackie Lomax and the Undertakers, oh, who were rivals of the Beatles in England. Absolutely, yeah. And um, when Bugs was uh, over here, he, um, he had a friend named John Fishbeck. And now John Fishbeck owned Crystal Recording Studios, and John did all of the early Stevie Wonder records, engineered all that sure. stuff. And, uh, well, John had a childhood friend of his, and he brought him to one of our rehearsals, and it was James Taylor before Fire and Rain came out or any of that. So um, we hung out with James, and we liked him. We ended up doing, we were a hard rock band, but we ended up doing a couple of his tunes, at, like Country Road, as hard rock tunes. Oh, exactly. Well, I get a call like a year later, and uh, or six months later, whatever it was, and Fire and Rain had, had, was just coming out, and James was offered a gig at the Troubadour in Hollywood. And they re he remembered me, so they called me up and said, could you come and do this show? And I said, sure. I figured it'd be one show. We went there. It was pretty quiet in the place. Then Fire and Rain came out. Then they called and said, we got offered to come back. We go back. The fire marshal had to practically close the place. Oh, it was a bomb threat and all this because they sold out the rafters because uh, suddenly he's on the cover of Time magazine and, that and all that. Powerful, yeah. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm sitting there in my fifth year of college. I still haven't got a degree. I kept changing majors. I was a science and art major in college. And um, Peter Asher, who was managing James at that point, said, well, James got offered a tour for a month. Uh, can you do it? And we, uh, I figured I'll do that and get back and finish school. And that month is still going on. <laughs> and I never went back to college, never told anybody I was leaving, never got my degree and all that. And, and I just went, you know. So. If you went back to that college now, you think they'd give you that degree? Um, no. no they <laughs> really? would, if I, if I, I'm sure it's too expensive to go back to. <laughs> no, it was Cal State Northridge, so it was a you know, nice state college. Um, but it's, you know, it's just weird. You, you, during your life, you come to all these little crossroads that happen and you make decisions and chances are both could have been good. But, mm -hmm. you know, you pick one. And I was lucky. There were so many guys, a la James Taylor, yeah. that were around at that point that didn't have what James had. And he was the guy I happened to hook up with. Right, right. And suddenly this huge wave started welling up. We were like in the perfect storm right. at that point. And so I went for the ride, and it took. And we were out there 20 years, and then suddenly, with his success, came uh, the, the advent of the West Coast sound and, right. and the singer-songwriter movement. So suddenly, I was in the studio doing Jackson Brown and right, right. Linda Ronstadt and right. all these people, right. and uh, it was amazing it, to be around that energy. Was really quite astounding. And, uh, but it, it, you seem to have continued that, which is amazing yeah. too in, in the process. Yeah. When you were doing this here, was it like a you know, were you listening to a lot of different records? Were you were you constantly in the mode of learning, or how did you keep we, going? We ended up working so much yeah. that we were kind of teaching ourselves as we were going. I mean, I was a fan of everything, so, right. uh, um, you know, I mean, I, w I was a huge, like I said, a fan of the English Invasion. Yeah. I was a huge Hendrix fan. I love Cream and yeah. Ten Years After and all these all those bands. Um, so I was always listening to that stuff, and I had always been, I was sometimes in five bands at one time, and you know, doing all kinds of stuff. So I, I was pretty eclectic in, in what I enjoy listening to, and I was always, always had it around. 
Um, it was funny when I started with James, that was kind of the last music I was involved with because I was like just playing rock and roll. I wanted to see people, you know, dancing on the floor and suddenly to be this sensitive, introspective music. I had to kind of think differently. And I think one of the blessings for me of being with James is so many of those singer-songwriters from that period when they played guitar, they just kind of flat-picked and did it. Right, right. James has this incredibly comprehensive style of finger-picking, so there's played, always yeah. a bass part going on in his thumb. So I had to think, am I going to just ape this guy's thumb parts? Am I going to come up with alternative parts that f dance around that? So I actually ended up suddenly having a reputation as this melodic bass player, right. which like McCartney was a hero of mine, and all yeah. that, where it wasn't just you know just sitting there like in Bill Haley in the Comets right, or something right. like that. Right, right, right. So all these different things kind of kind of align. But I listen to all kinds of stuff, and you know, if I can incorporate something, you know, I, I'm I'm not adverse to, to plagiarizing. Um, you know, within within reason, just in the same way, I'm I'm honored when guys come up and say, "Man, I've I've taken so many of your bass lines." Like, man, it's, it's it's in the universe. Yeah, you know? right. This is cyberspace. Just right, right. dig it and enjoy <laughs> it. You know, it's, I'm fine. So, in the process of traveling and playing with James and his style of playing, you begin to find kind of your own sound. Yeah. Did that start with James at all, or was it? Well, I think. Before James, I had, never, I, the, I had only been in the studio once before, oh, before James. Um, I w when I was in this band, Wolfgang, we, we were called Wolfgang because our manager was Bill Graham, whose real name was Wolfgang. Oh, that's and um, <laughs> David Rubinson uh, in San Francisco yeah. brought us up there and we cut a bunch of tracks for him, which still stand up today. The, the band was killer. It was a great band, but nothing ever came of it um, for us. So it, it was one of those situations that when I we got in the studio, it's it's like it's like you're not just a car putting along; you're a top fuel dragster, yeah. because we suddenly had to hit the road, doing sessions, right. and we're all kind of going. I've never heard myself play before. I've never done. So it was kind of like you really had to get your shit together really Very fast, fast yeah. Yeah. and um, and and really understand what the studio was about and. To digress slightly on this, I was in a band uh, called Group Therapy in 1967, and Mike Post was our producer. I um, yeah. And yeah. we weren't allowed to play on our record. It was at, 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 at United Studios in Hollywood, and um, the Wrecking Crew guys all played on our record. And I remember in '67 looking yeah, through the window, and there's it was Carol Kay and Bobby West on bass. It was Hal Blaine. Jim Gordon was the percussionist. Mike Rubini, Mike Melvoin, and Larry Nechtel were the keyboard players. Oh, Mike no. Dacey, Dennis Budimir, all these guys. And I'm looking through the window just kind of going, wow, check these <laughs> Those guys. Are the guys yeah. These are the cats. Yeah. And like three and a half years later, I was working with them every day. Incredible. So it's very strange how these things happen. And then because of my relationship with Mike, then I ended up doing every one of his TV shows from Rockford Files on. Mike had the he whole... He was the king of television. He was the he king. It. He owned all of them. Yeah, we did Magnum P.I. and Hill Street Blues and the A-Team yeah. and, and all these different shows. And, I remember witnessing one of his sessions. Um, Willie O'Nellis had invited yeah, me down. Yeah, I love Willie. And we got a chance to kind of watch. It was I, actually it was the last Magnum P.I. episode. Okay. It was the, the two-hour ep episode. Yeah. One was. And it was brilliant the way it was. And I asked Mike, I said, Mike, you know, did, did you, you know, what was your instrument? Did you play in bands? And he really didn't. He, he really kind of just... He caught the tail end of the Wrecking Crew. He did some sessions with those guys, and he was the musical director for Andy Williams. Right, exactly. And right. he did classical gas with Mason Williams. He oh, arranged wow. that yeah. and all that. Mike's really good. He was really a talented cat. So yeah. you started doing a lot of the TV stuff. Yeah. So did the TV stuff come before any of the movie stuff? or how, how did um, That, that all kind of came together. Oh, interesting, um, yeah. I mean, it was James... For a couple of albums and Jackson and and that whole kind of California West Coast sound when they were starting to bring all these guys together right, and right. these different bands like Poco and the Eagles and all these groups were forming out of yeah. that. There was a, a great a great period in there. I mean, when we got to do like the David Crosby Graham Nash records yeah. and and did some CSN stuff and all this. This business is really kind of based on networking. And so I, I, the more I was in the studio, the more I met people and all that. And then I would suddenly get some calls and somebody would say, oh, we're doing a movie. Would you like to do it? And I'd say, yeah, I'd love to. And went in there and it, suddenly you're getting your reading chops back up and all that. And I used to do um, a, a lot of Gene Page sessions for him, a lot of Motown stuff. Right. And you go in there and there's these, these 
reams of paper with just reams, you know yeah. like spray painted black and yeah. it's all syncopated. So I, I had my and you're having to double like the left hand of a clavinet. So you have to be accurate <laughs> and all that because um, you always think the other guys are all better than you and they're, <laughs> they're, they're going to nail it. Um, so it all kind of just became this big mishmash. I, I would start to meet guys that had jingle companies and we were doing, but it was also kind of, I, it was really kind of the golden age of all of this. Um, there were so many sessions going on. I mean, you literally were turning work down, right. which hardly happens anymore unless there's a dramatic conflict of scheduling. Right. But those days, the, the, you, you could go six days a week and do three, four, five sessions a day. And because uh, everybody was getting signed, right. um, there were right. budgets, right. there were labels, even yeah. everybody hated them, but there was a machine that actually got product out. Right. Um, to me, kind of one of the biggest downfalls of the music business has been the advent of, of digital technology. Because I remember even when, you're, when we were kids, you know, yeah. you'd go to somebody's house and hear a record. Absolutely. You go, man, it's great, I got it. And then you go to the record store and buy your copy. Absolutely. And even when it went to cassettes, you know, you go, one generation and it's turning to crap. Yeah. Man, as soon as CDs came along, it was over. Nobody was purchasing. You, you, right. one, they, they pool some resources and get a duplicator. It changed everything. But it yeah. also seemed like the quality of the sound was almost no. too clean and too perfect. It's so not good. It's not, it's not, not the same as yeah. what we experienced growing up to, which was what we just thought was normal, which yeah. was at that time. Yeah. And it got, it's too pristine. Yeah, in, in the process now. So this generation doesn't. Yeah, you, have you, you, you they, to... well, I mean, one of the things I'm trying to, one of my mantras for myself is, don't be an old fart. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I don't want to go in a room with a bunch of young cats in there and start talking about the difference between analog and digital right. when they've never heard analog. Right, right, right. You just sound like an old fool right, just talking. Right. About. Right. Now, if they say. What was it like when you guys were doing it all analog? Bam, I'm all over it. Yeah, you know, I'm happy yeah. to share yeah, you know, yeah. these, these stories. But we're doing more and more sessions nowadays with uh, cutting to tape. And uh, the artist I've been touring with all this past year, Judith Owen, she released her album on a high quality uh, LP. Be yeah. Besides, you know, the, the CDs and download availability. Right, 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 right. And when we're doing the swag counters and all that stuff after the shows, it's amazing how many albums we're selling on oh, it. And oh. people are going, oh man, I got a great old turntable and you know, yeah. my amps and all. I think people are, were kind of hungry. You got a little tired of this antiseptic um, well, sonic. It, it, it really kind of numbed the industry for And me. it also crunched everything down into this one bandwidth mm -hmm. where you know, as soon as you got, because like when I would record with Phil Collins, we'd always do like the bass and drums and everything were all cut to the machine, yeah. the tape, and then yeah. they would, you know, Dump that, dub that down, and then he could work on other stuff, you know, because there are simplicities that come with having the digital format. But to get there uh, on, on analog first is is pretty cool. That's you powerful. Know. Is there a, anyone that stands out as far as how they record? Like Phil Collins, you mentioned, you know, James. Does anybody have a um, a sound or a style that's something specific that is unique to them? Well, they're all kind of unique to themselves. The, the problem like with Phil was, we knew, almost never recorded as an ensemble. I would be like the first guy, and Phil would go in and demo some stuff with like a drum machine right. and humming some lyrics, and then I would come in and figure out bass parts to this, and then Daryl would come in and do guitar parts. Um, James was always, it was the band, because we spent, we also spent time, I mean, nowadays, you, could, you go in there and you two days, and everybody's, Come on, guys, and yeah, yeah. we'd go in for a month. We'd recut and recut, find things. You know, right. He'd listen to the song a bunch and go, ah, that we could use a bridge, or I don't like the bridge or the chorus on this. Right. And we would fine tune this, and there were a lot of experiments that happened that right. turned out to be pretty cool, right. which wouldn't happen nowadays because everybody's looking at the clock, going, we've got to get five tracks That's today, let's get out of here. There's been all kinds of different stuff like that. I mean, I did a lot of stuff for Sheffield Labs that were like direct to disc. I remember gigs, the Sheffield Labs. You know, and so yeah. it was always fun when you go in and you're under the complete stress of Absolutely. that kind of recording. And, uh, and, the, and that for me, most of my memories and feelings about this are really kind of related to like the different artists. I mean, I'd find myself in the studio and I'd look through the window and there's, there's Andy Griffith. Or there's Andy Williams or Anthony Newley, yeah. uh, you know, all these different people. And like I said, I'm this consummate dork fan. So you find yourself kind of sitting there, you know, when you're sitting in the control room next to Streisand and talking about the tune. And 
you know, you just go, how the hell did I get here? What am but, I but, doing here? But you know, the, the, you, you have to understand the, the, the sound that you've created on the instrument. Yeah. It really is your own sound. Yeah. It's so unique. And as many bass players that are out there, nobody really has your sound. It's weird to me when people come up and say, you're on such and such a record, aren't you? I know that's you. I know that's you. And, and I don't know what that is. I, I don't really, uh, I've, I'm, I'm not an intellectual musician in terms of like, I know these guys that, I mean, they can play every scale perfect and everything, every, every note is just this nugget. Um, I've had a lot of hand problems over the years. And so, so I, like Mike Post always said, man, you're the king of the glissando. Because I do a lot of sliding around when I'm playing and my fingering's really sh um, because of, problems with like this finger doesn't quite have the dexterity of the others because of the tendon problem. So I ended up compensating for some physical issues which ended up creating a style. So your weaknesses produced your strengths. Yeah, yeah, Interesting. yeah absolutely. That's Interesting. a great way to put it. Interesting concept. Yeah. That, that's very, very powerful. Um, in the same way, one of the upright books that I studied with was written by a, bass, a, a, a classical bassist that, that lost two fingers. And so all the fingers were the fingerings in the book were these weird fingerings to compensate the fact that he didn't have two of his fingers. Yeah. And sometimes you'd get into these things and you'd go, that's pretty cool the way that works. And <laughs> there were times when I'd play where I would purposely not use certain fingers uh, they, just in case something happens to that one. I don't want to be you know, out in the dark. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but the sound came, I think, from the from an, an inadequacy, an inadequacies more than anything. How amazing. How was the change from upright to electric well, it was easier from the standpoint that I didn't have to bleed to be heard <laughs> and and it, it was one thing of like when I would play j in a little jazz club or something like that with yeah. just like maybe a, a, a trumpet and a tenor and a, and a drummer or something yeah. upright was great but man soon soon as the guitar players and piano players had amplifiers you were in deep trouble yeah, change the game, yeah. and change uh, the game. across the street from the Union now is a place called Stein on Vine yeah. Well, it used to be under the Union when it was just Stein's place. And we went in there, and my dad bought me a, um, a melody bass and a St. George amp. I think it was probably the whole thing cost like 80 bucks for every <laughs> amp and the bass. And uh, I just went home and started playing and uh, figured out how the neck worked on that. Because it was, a, first off, it's a transition going from fretless to, you know, a fretless upright to right. a fretted bass. Right, right. The, um, I still, like sometimes if I hold an electric bass up, and just kind of play it like this. I actually play it better than I do playing it like this because the ergonomic of that still makes more sense to me than this one. Interesting. Um, but it, it didn't take long you know, to adjust to it. And the only drag to me was once things clicked and started taking off, I never got a call for upright. Nobody wanted upright. It was all electric work. Yeah. And it's not riding a bike. You don't just get back in the saddle and right. go. And I found my chops just kind of went away, and I had this beautiful old mid-1800s Czech bass. And a friend of mine, Peter Marshall, who played with Kenny Rankin, yes, yes. I think his bass was stolen, and I, and I heard about it, and I ended up selling it to him. and Because uh, that was his whole career, was, uh, was around that, and I wasn't using it. I thought, it's stupid that things just did. There's a part of me that regrets it, because I couldn't afford that bass now, and I sold it to him for, like, super cheap. But... Um, and then by the time I started getting calls like that, then I had friends like John Patitucci and Chuck DeMonico and these guys, and I was going, I call this cat. Yeah. You know, I, I could fake it, but I always believed that whatever the, is best for the project is what needs to be done, and I've never been so possessive about things that I go, well, oh, it's my gig. It's not. I just say, if I think there's somebody that's better, if I got called for a heavy slap pop gig, I got friends that eat that stuff for breakfast, right, and right. for me, I struggle through that that style. So I'd you know, call him; Absolutely. it'll be, it'll be great. But that's another mantra of yours: what's best, what's best for the tune, the servant of yeah, the song. That, exactly. That, you you really own that clearly. Yeah. When you play, you you are in that song at that moment. Yeah. I've talked to to Steve Gadd many times, and you really capture that that comfort zone that you create. Yeah. That just lays down a foundation of just pure. And, yeah, and if fun. the song wants a whole note. In each bar, I'm good with that. There's yeah, nothing yeah. embarrassing about playing a whole note. Yeah. Then I try to explain to the guys, how are you going to play that whole note? Yeah. If it's an E, is it going to be? Are you going to play open E on the bottom? Are you going to do it up an octave? Yeah. How, what's your release like? A little vibrato when you go to, to the next note? Are you going to just go bop boom? Or are you going to go boom? You know, do a little 
you know, glisten. Right. The options are almost infinite on how to treat one note. Yeah. If you're doing 30 second notes and playing some fusion stuff, if your chops are up, no, no problem. Right, right, right. But, but you know, whole notes, half notes, you're pretty exposed. You know, so you better powerful. do them right. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Did you ever have, you know, as, as the younger generations in the future begin to watch this and hear what you're talking about, were there times where you had challenges, whether it was business time or playing wise, you know, with, 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 with the ch times that really kind of put you down to, to be a little bit down on the industry at all? Well, there's aspects I've been down on the industry ever since day one. Yeah. And it's because there are aspects of just like life. Yeah. There's things that happen that you just kind of go, people come in that are in positions of authority that start making decisions because they think it has to justify why they're there. Right. And you just kind of go, you don't have a clue what you're talking right. about. Right. Um, on one of my bases, I, the first, one of the first things I did was I put a thing I call my producer switch on it. And uh, when, the, when a producer comes in and says, uh, could you make this shimmer a little bit more? I go, well, check this out. I make sure they see me hit that switch and then I just change my hand position and they go, well, that's great. There's no wires or anything going there. It's a placebo. But it gets me through a lot of bull so. <laughs> um, The positives of this business so outweigh yeah. any of the negatives that I don't even dwell on that. I mean, I've, I've worked with a few pant loads in this business that I could care less if I ever saw again. Right. But I would say 95% of the people I've worked with, um, I have utmost respect for and enjoy being around them yeah. and, and working with them and for them. Right, right. Um, I miss, on one hand, I miss the labels. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. there was an infrastructure, even though you knew where you were going to get ripped off. Right, right, right. But your product was going to be heard. Right. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, it's really a brave new world yeah, that, that's yeah, come yeah. along. Um, yeah. I think there's opportunities and that if you find an avenue to get it in and you're doing it all yourself, right. you don't have to sell much product to make as much money as you would have made doing right. a platinum record right. for a label. Absolutely. Now, that's, that's the, the dilemma, but it's how do you get to that point where people are hearing it at all, other than when MySpace was popular right. or on YouTube right. and things. and then generally you have to come up with something really quirky, which may not be great musically, just to get attention. Right. So it's a strange time. I'm, I'm on a certain level grateful that I'm in the twilight of my career and yeah. not starting now. Well, I hear you um, loud and clear with that. Yeah. Because really very, very so, do I don't really know what's going to do. Do you find that, like, you talked about networking before, is, is, you know, has Facebook or social media assisted you now with that, where, where you can connect with people that way? A bit. Um, there's some people that have contacted me on, on, on uh, Facebook that said, you know, we'd love to work it. And what I do is I kind of feel them out on there. And if it finally feels like it's legit, then I give them another email address and we get off Facebook and talk. Okay. But I, I ended up getting a call from a guy named Helga Van Dyke, who's a, um, a, 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 I forget where he's from, he's Danish or something, a producer. But he called me about doing a project with this kid who was from Switzerland. So I, we talked and everything. We ended up doing this thing. I put, got to put the band together. So I got Abe Laboreal Jr. Oh. and Jim Cox. And, oh. he's good. and this kid played great guitar. <laughs> and we did the, he came, they all flew over here and we did the album here at Village Recorders. Then Helga called me a while back and we did a girl um, named uh, Deshan, who's Tibetan. She lives in London, but her father has a, a, a monastery in, in, in the Himalayas. <laughs> and they had the, the monks were the background singers, and it was oh, all kind of a pop twist on mantras. So, you know, I mean, these things come along, and this came, and, and there's been a bunch of those that came up through Facebook. Yeah. So, you know, I just go, you know, this is cool. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, have, I think social media is, uh, is a good thing for the most part. Right. I kind of embraced the social network and realized that it's all content driven. Yeah. And if you don't put up content, people stop coming. Right. So I'm there every day and I post all kinds of stuff from, from Ricardo Muti's acceptance speech yeah. as, as the musician of the year, which is one of the greatest speeches ever spoken mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, um, to you know, turning people on to, to different, like the flower duet by Dalim playing this and people, because they have things they've heard but they didn't know or excerpts from West Side Story. But <laughs> then I post a lot of crap I've worked on over the years and stuff and just talk about like the dig Jeff Vaccaro's drum part on this tune and stuff like that. Once again, I think the thing that to me is the essence of everything that I do is all the song. Right. Um, and I just did a master class at Berkeley 
Um, I was back there playing with Judith Owen, and we had a day off the next day, and we were played in Boston at this club that's actually affiliated with the Berkeley campus. Nice. So um, Steve Bailey said, can you stay on a day, and I'll schedule a class with you. And I, so I was talking to these, these kids, like 200 bass players in this room. I said, I'm not putting anybody down, but I said, when I go on YouTube or on Facebook, when guys are posting videos of them playing, all I'm seeing is chops. Right. I'm not seeing anybody addressing how to address a song, tone, right. any of this stuff. I said, now, if you want to go to the NAMM show and sit in a booth and impress people for 30 seconds sprints, you, you're on the right track. Yeah. But I said, yeah. if you want to work yeah. and get a <laughs> job, you better start thinking about songs. And, and you don't go in and immediately, the minute the song starts to play, start playing. <laughs> you sit down and listen to it and let the song dictate to you what the song wants you to do. Right. And that's why, you know, if it's a simple little part where there's really almost nothing going on except just this rich foundation, that's good. Yeah. That's good. And if I found myself, well, you know, when I was in the studio with Billy Cobb, I'm doing Spectrum. <laughs> it's a whole other animal. Absolutely. But the thing is that you need is you need the facilities to do that variety of work. Just because you have them doesn't mean you have to whip them out. Right. And that's where I think a lot of that just comes with experience. You know, because you, you're so horny to play when you're yeah, young absolutely. and all that. So you're like just flailing all the time. <laughs> and at a certain point, you just go, hey, it's a, or you hear back a recording of you. And you go, what was I thinking? Because <laughs> when you're in the moment, you're not thinking. There, there is in thing. this transcendental kind of a space. Absolutely. But that's what, what you have always done. I've always said that you know, wisdom is the combination of knowledge and experience. And you really have kind of balanced that, that yeah. knowledge and that experience so well that you bring every song this attention that is in the moment, in the now, yeah. and forever. Yeah. And that's a powerful, Leland, that's a powerful, powerful yeah. thing that It'd you do. It'd be very hard for me to ever play the same uh, songs twice the same, same way. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. when I'm in the moment recording, yeah. I'm gone and I'll listen back and I can't double that part. Or if I think I'm going to have to double a part, like with a piccolo bass or something like yeah, that, yeah. I really have to make a concerted effort to pay attention to what I'm doing mm -hmm. so that I'm not just sitting there no, you know, bar by bar punching right. in. Right, 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 right. And I just shut down and I just let the song tell me what to do. And it really it has got nothing to do with technical facility or anything. I just go... I just know, I have one friend that always goes, man, you pick the right octaves. Because a lot of times, the, the, one of the songs I did was Maho the theme for Mahogany with Diana Ross. Diana Ross, sure, sure. And that was cut like with four rhythm sections before the one I was involved with. But apparently on the intro, all the guys were always just, it was just these parts were being played. And I listened to it and I thought, this is so delicate that I started way up the neck into this real high part. And when the song finally kicked in, came down, and that ended up being the, the one that they used. Yeah. It was just, it felt like that was the right thing to do. Right. And I, I try to be intuitive as I can. And, you know, and, and I also have another one of, I have a lot of sayings to myself. <laughs> Everything I do is etched in mud. You know, because, you know, if somebody comes to me with a better idea, I'm happy to hear it. Yeah. You know, give, me an, give me another idea. Let me you know, explore something else that I wouldn't have necessarily thought of. But that's an open mind that yeah, is but very important. Yeah, but you really have. have to do that. You really have to be pliable and flexible. And, uh, and sometimes my gut instinct is dead on. Yeah. And other times I'm kind of in my mind going, I don't know, you know, let me just hear this a couple of times. And so, then maybe a guitar player will kick something out. I go, that's cool. Let's, let's develop that. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, to me, music is a very organic experience. Even if you're doing techno pop and stuff with like a lot of machine, Absolutely. there's ways of taking that this machine and doing something that weaves all around it that becomes very fluid and allows that machine to have more humanity. Absolutely. Yeah. To so. finally find a way to communicate. To the mass that they can feel what that whole yeah. process is. I mean, think about the power of that message. Yeah. Leland, in the course of closing, we'll have many generations in the future that watch this that are still able to research you and, 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 and step into your world of what you've created. What would you leave the next generation with an understanding of where you think music is now, where it will go, and what you, you know, captured from hmm. this? It's a great question. One of the things I've noticed such tremendous changes in the music business, but one thing that hasn't changed is music. You know, there's a very 
big difference between those two terms. Yeah. Um, I find myself working with artists that are in their teens still, who come in and take my head off. There, there, there's so much talent. I think that the main thing people have to do with music is music is, a, is one, of the, it's one of the greatest things that separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom, even though you have howler monkeys and different birds. That, that's right. a, there's a thing in the human organism to, create, to creating the arts more than anything that that's remarkable and I think that's just something everybody needs to embrace at whatever time in history that that they're living if, if somebody's watching this this video 50 or 100 years from now and and there's still a world to enjoy um, they should enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed this and be as creative as you can um, allow the music to um, express your your inner feelings. I mean, it's it's one of the greatest vehicles. I think one of the things I've enjoyed most about my career is being able to travel the world and and experience a universal language. Mm. Where literally you're looking at an audience that doesn't have an idea of what any of these lyrics mean, yet they're they're mouthing all of them. Mm. Um, they're, sw they're, they're responding exactly the way it's supposed to be responding, even though they don't understand it because the music is, is this transitory experience that just gets inside of you. And I think no matter when we are in history, I think this is one of the great things that, that really weaves the human, the human spirit and, and, and the human creature together. And uh, the hell with politics and all the madness that, that goes on around this, you have to just sort of shut that out and be true to yourself and just relish the fact that you were blessed enough to do this. Boy, you have truly allowed the message to be heard in everything you have done, where the audience feels and reacts, and they are lifted because of everything that you have done. That is the power of what you have done. Leland Sklar, thank you so much on behalf of the it's sessions. Absolute joy to be you here. You are the best. Thank you so thank much. You so thank much. you so, so much. <laughs>